Yeah. All right. Well, hello, everybody. I'm the Orca Man. Uh, also, Fred Orca Man was the name given to me by TikTok, as some of you already know. Welcome to another episode of this wonderful podcast. Today, I'm here with Michaela. Michaela, I'll shift it over to you to introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Michaela. Um, I study marine biology at the University of Alaska Southeast in beautiful Juneau. Um, I'm originally from Southern California, where I work as a wildlife photographer on a whale watching boat. Um, I did two years of community college down there, then transferred up here, and it was a big change, but really like it. Um, yeah, like I said, I'm a wildlife photographer. I volunteered at a couple aquariums. I'm also like on TikTok with Fred. That's how I met Fred and YouTube, Instagram, just all that jazz. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. And I'll give you a chance at the end too, to plug all your socials and things like that. So we can send people your way as well. I have them check out all, all the stuff that you're doing. When you did the transfer, was that actually, was that this year? Was this the first year that you're in Juno? Yes. So I originally was planning on transferring wherever I ended up transferring this upcoming fall. So fall 2021. Okay. And I applied to Southeast and they emailed me within like a day. They were like, oh yeah, you can come up in next fall. And I was like, cool. And then like at the end of November, they emailed me saying, we have space for you in the spring semester if you want to come. So oh, I literally sure. I dropped everything and moved 3,000 miles away from home within like a month's notice. In January? Yeah, I moved up <laughs> That's sick. Once you got up to Juneau, I, now my Alaskan geography, I know I'm a geography major, but it's still, still shoddy. In Juneau, when you got there, how long slash short were the days? Because that's one thing I always hear about Alaska that I'm never sure of in terms of how far up or down. So... Juneau is more southeast. That's southeast Alaska. Fair. And it's right by, I want to say British Columbia, I think. Okay. And so one of the fun things people do here is they just fly to Canada for the day and then they fly back. So that's oh, how okay. Canada gotcha. is to Canada. But when I flew up here, it was getting dark right around like 245. And then it was getting light out, I think at nine. So <laughs> I was getting up at 6 a.m. and I was like, where's the sun <laughs> it doesn't exist it now i think it gets light out at like 5 15 and it's light out until nine so it's yeah. really nice. yeah that's insane yeah because that was one of the things too even when i moved from um massachusetts is where i'm originally from i came out to even i'm in vancouver bc right now i like during the winters it won't the sun won't go down at two it'll go down around like five but over the summers, it goes down at 10, which is mind boggling to me. Um, so that's one thing about this kind of area all up and down the coast that I've always found super weird and disorienting, but really, really nice at the same time. <laughs> it's really disorienting. Like um, the past couple nights, the Northern Lights have been like so amazing because it's been super clear. And so me and my friends were like, oh, we're gonna stay up. And we we're like, okay, we gotta stay up because if we're gonna stay up until like midnight, we gotta do something. Hell so yeah. We went, through, we went through the McDonald's drive through and my friend was like, I'm so tired. What time is it? And I was like, I don't know. It's probably like six. It was 845 at night. There you go. There you I was go. like, never mind. It's almost nine o'clock, but it looks the same <laughs> as 645. Of course. Of course. Now I can only imagine. Is this also too? So have you been to Alaska before going in January? Nope. Oh, oh that's a <laughs> switch. Well, also too then, have you seen Northern Lights before you went up there? No, I'm... Like I said, this I'm from Southern like, California. There was like nothing no, like fair. this up there, yeah. That's super sick then, being able to go up and having it be a, like a semi-consistent thing right now at the least. Like, what are you doing your weekends? Well, there's a there's one of the coolest phenomenons on earth happening. We can go check it out. I, um, on my 21st birthday back in February, my friends called me at like 12.45 in the morning. They're like, yo, come down to the dock and the Northern Lights are out. And I was like, cool, see you in a minute. <laughs> like a one minute walk and... I have to like take a step back and I'm like, I live where people only dream of vacationing or coming to see these things. And it's like, yeah. well, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to put that into perspective too, especially when it is easier to see the Northern lights. Like you said, that one minute walk than it is for like, it's as easy to do that as it is for most people to go like get a bag of Doritos. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like it's the same, like it's the same amount of trip, it's the same amount of energy, <laughs> which is, which is absurd, but that's super yeah. sick. Yeah. Um, when you said you were a wildlife photographer, so I'm not sure, are you doing anything else in um, Alaska with wildlife photography or is that just in Southern California? 
At this point, no, because whale watching is seasonal up here because up until a week ago, we were in a four month long blizzard basically. So it's so not fun. ideal. <laughs> I would go whale watching in that circumstance, but not everyone wants to. And I planned on staying up here in the summer to be a wildlife photographer on a whale watching boat. Definitely. But Canada extended their cruise ship ban and mm-hmm. Canada is a major port to stop in on the way up to Alaska on cruises. Gotcha. So can't stop in Canada you can't go up to Alaska so I had a couple jobs lined up and then they basically fired me before I even started Uh, but uh yeah my wildlife photography I worked part-time there when I lived down in California but now it's just whenever I'm home for spring and summer break that's super nice what's the uh what's the place that you work with down there so I work for Newport Coastal Adventure. It's a, I don't want to say small business because it's it's very well known, but it's compared to every other whale watching company down there. It's relatively small. It's owned by one guy. It's owned by my boss and we do little Zodiac boats. So I think it's a lot more cooler than the big, like bigger vessels because you're going like 35 miles an hour and you can cover a lot more ground that way or a lot more water that way. (laughs) No, more than fair, more than fair. When you're going what do you think is the hardest thing in terms of like actually doing the photography on the water and getting the right shots because that's one thing that when I look at it like I've already I've tried with my phone before and it only works so well in terms of like timing and like ever getting all the aspects together is not it's not easy (laughs) it's not and um pretty much it depends on the condition because since our boat is so small if they're there's days where I've walked off my boat like totally drenched so some days like I won't even bring out my camera because my my expensive lens and my expensive camera is not going to be ruined (laughs) but it's working on a small boat a lot of the time I'm on my knees getting at water level so there have been days where I over the summer I'll walk off the boat with like bloody kneecaps but oh shit (laughs) it's really (laughs) fun though and I've I did, I used my phone a little bit for like video, but yeah. you can't like, it doesn't even compare to using like a really big camera. And when I eventually saved up my money for it, there's so much that goes into getting one shot. Cause there'll be some days where I work 13 plus hours and I'm like, yeah. all right, I have two shots that I <laughs> post on my Instagram because with way dolphins are a little bit more predictable and they're usually in bigger numbers so there's at least one dolphin doing something cool but when you're watching humpbacks and it breaches and you miss it you're like that's it that's it (laughs) i'm screwed for the whole day (laughs) so the settings on your camera can pretty much stay the same unless there's like a huge lighting train change yeah it's all about like positioning and there are some days where it's just so rough and so horrible I don't even take my camera out it just stays on in my case no that's super fair and this is another thing too that I like I keep on telling people when they go for whale watches and things like that and they're thinking about like taking the pictures like because I know on some of the bigger boats as well they'll have people that are like designated like you are a photographer you're going to go out every day and take uh, photos to make sure that you can get it but it's like the amount of chance that goes into any one is kind of absurd exactly like you were saying before which i've always like i don't think everybody fully understands that even if you're on the water 24 7 all the time you'll have a couple yeah my friend she's been doing it longer than i have she's she also works for newport coastal she tells me there will be weeks where she like doesn't even take out her camera and she has to like dig in her archives to find something to post that's fair that's fair speaking of posting so you which platform did you start on? Because I know you have TikTok. I'm pretty sure you have Instagram and then YouTube as well. But you've, well, been, doing, started, you've been doing it for a while. I started my Instagram. My Instagram, um, aside from my photography one, is more just like a personal one. Like I'll post like Fair. everyday things I do. Yeah. But I started to like kind of incorporate more marine biology stuff in as well and Sick. marine photography. But nice. I started YouTube. I did like makeup videos like way better (laughs) and I uploaded a video it was 10 things you should know before majoring in marine biology Mm -hmm. December of 2019 and I think it has like almost 50,000 views so I was like checked yeah I was like this is what the people want to see and (laughs) over quarantine I started posting like more 
like ocean videos and more marine biology and whale watching. Yeah. So I've been doing YouTube for marine biology a little over a year. And then I just cool. started TikTok probably like consecutively posting probably like, oh gosh, January, four <laughs> months ago. Yeah, no, same, same. That was exactly when I, when I first got into it too. Jay, like it was, it was just far enough into quarantine where it's just like, okay, fine. We're going to, we're going to do it. We're going to try it. Yes. So that's super interesting though. The YouTube though, it's been, it's been up for a good while for that. Do you use the same camera that you use when you go out on the whale watch and stuff like that? Cause the quality is super solid. No, I have a, I have a smaller one. Um, it's a Canon M50. So nice. that, that's what a lot of different YouTubers use. Like when you see like the family vlogging channels, that's what <laughs> they use because I'm too lazy to change my lens. I have a 100 to 400 lens. So it's like pretty Large. decently sized. Yeah. And I'm, I'm too lazy to change that out. So I was like, I'd rather just buy a separate camera. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's more than fair. That's more than fair. And we were talking literally right before this, we were talking about like how long it takes, you didn't realize how long it takes to like set stuff up or otherwise. What do you think with YouTube is the biggest thing that you like thought took uh, not a lot of time, but ended up taking up more time than you could have imagined? Number one, planning a video, because there are some videos mm. where I just have so much information that I have to write <laughs> it down. Yeah. And I don't want to be sitting here like reading a script on my YouTube. <laughs> so I have to like memorize things. And I'm, cause I'm not, I know my stuff when it comes to like killer whales and stuff, of but course. other whales, I don't know everything about them. So I have to like read it. And then I'm like, no, I have to memorize it. <laughs> my video. So I'm not looking like a robot reading a script. Of course editing i'm a perfectionist like if there's one thing wrong even when i'm editing pictures if <laughs> one thing doesn't look right i will scratch the whole thing and like start <laughs> all over and just the surroundings especially living in college now because i can't tell my roommate hey can you please shut uh, up I can film this yeah. video. <laughs> but at home um my brother moved out he's in the military my mom's a nurse gotcha. so he's never home so i'm like mm -hmm. i have my peace but there you go it's so hard to just get the perfect video film because something goes wrong or you can hear things in the background and it's, I never imagined it being such hard work. I always thought it was just like, hey guys, like today <laughs> I'm doing this, but it's, it's not, it goes so far more into that. Yeah, there's one, uh, I think the phrase that I, oh, like that I hear that I sincerely believe fits with everything, video writing or otherwise, if it's easy to consume, there's hours of work into it. Oh yeah, <laughs> sure. Or like if you're watching it, you're like, this is awesome. This is so seamless. It's like, that wasn't <laughs> originally. Like that seamlessness right there took a hundred different takes. <laughs> <laughs> took a hundred different takes and then like a couple hours of sitting down and trying to figure out which ones worked. Yes, and then editing is a whole different story because then you have to find background music and then you have to do titles. And if you want pictures <laughs> in it, cause there are some videos where I am like, there's pictures everywhere. And then there's other videos where there's absolutely nothing. And I'm like, we're just going to upload it. It's fine. I don't it think we're gonna care that much. <laughs> It'll be good. Well, the, the, I, because I'm just getting into this realm of, I'll call it YouTube more than anything else. Like TikTok, I'm, I'm just, just starting, but even with TikTok, like captions, like there's, there's the one, um, there's the one app threads where they will caption videos, but it'll only be for 15 seconds. So you need to split it up into 15 seconds and then do it and then put it onto TikTok. And I look at that and I'm like, that's too much work. <laughs> it's like very simply. Um, sometimes I'll type them out, but there are certain ones that I'll like, I'll make and I'm like, I don't care if it's seen by however many people, it will be fine for now. If somebody really uh, wants to know the information, I'll type it out for them. But for the, for the straight up information, it's just like, ah. It's just, it's not, it's not worth it. That's also one of my favorite things about the podcast too, is because my goal with it is to like record it continuously. Like mm -hmm. the things that I post, I want them to be the full hour, like straight through. I'm not going to go through and like chop it up. Um, one for like, let's say authenticity sake, but two, because I don't want to. <laughs> it's long. It's so long. I recent, I just filmed Sunday what we're doing now but with a commercial fisherman and yeah. when we went back and rewatched it 
we were like, oh, we should probably cut that out because it could be interpreted the wrong way. So I'm sitting there, my computer is like gonna burst into flames because <laughs> of how, how much it has to work right now. Definitely. So I'm sitting there like watching almost a two hour long video and I'm like, I don't wanna hear myself talk anymore. <laughs> I'm so tired of it. No, that's more than fair. That's more than fair. I think that's also one of the things too, when I've started to like really get myself down because I've, my goal, I want to talk about everything on this podcast. I want to talk about um, captures, free willy, the people that are working on whale watch boats, the people that are like doing um, the whale watching sites all up and down the coast, the people that are doing research in remote places of the world. There's a Sri Lankan orca project. I'm like, that would be cool. <laughs> um but because there are so many like topics that are hot and could be misinterpreted, it's it's almost like a reset. Like I keep on telling myself, like, all right, sit down, take two seconds, <laughs> think through what you're trying to say, and then go from there. And it's it it's it changes the way it changes the cadence in the way that like I, I want to say that I attack some of the questions too. It definitely does. Yeah. Like when me and my friend were talking about the fishing industry her parents are super involved in it. And so she said a couple things and she's like, oh crap, like, can we cut that out? Because if someone takes it the wrong way, then people are freaking crazy. They're gonna like try and find these people and like attack them on the internet. And it's just, it was a lot of work to edit all that out. <laughs> yeah, more than fair, more than fair. And P and that's the thing that I found too, especially like I haven't seen anything on YouTube yet because my YouTube isn't like large at all um but tiktok there's a couple of videos that i've posted um where it's not the comments that will get me because i usually for some of them i posted one video a while back that was like um it's like we should free all the killer whales and I, basically my whole thing is like where are you gonna put them where are they gonna go who's gonna pay for it and a lot of people will do it and not like give answers they'll just be mad i'm like don't get me wrong it's not ideal <laughs> It's like, I don't agree with orcas in captivity, but I'd agree that the orcas should be in the best place that they should be and like yeah. physically possible. But the, the responses are so visceral that it's not to the point. It's just like, oh no, I'm, I have a lot of energy and thought about this particular point. Like the tanks are smaller than the parking lot. Yeah, to run a tank that would be the size of a parking lot be a lot of, <laughs> a lot of money and a lot of like resources to do. It's, it's funny to watch people go off to say the least. My friend actually sent me that TikTok of yours talking about where are you going to put them to me <laughs> this morning because I was FaceTiming her last night. She's like, what are you doing tomorrow? And I was like, oh, I'm filming this podcast with my friend and then I have schoolwork. And then she sent me that this morning and I was like, that's the guy who I'm filming <laughs> this podcast with. <laughs> and she has sent me like almost every one of your videos and I had to tell her, I was like, dude, I follow him. I really appreciate <laughs> you like sending them to me, but I follow him and you don't oh, need that. <laughs> That's so cool. That's as I, I, I can imagine you will do this with um, your YouTube and TikTok as well. It's like, you can't conceptualize how many people are actually interacting with your stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's always, it's, it's super cool to hear. And I'm so, I'm so glad that it, like, it's one, one being shared, but two, it's like being enjoyed. I've had a couple, I've had a lot of people message me on my personal Instagram saying like, Hey, I, I watched your videos. Like, I really want to do marine biology. Like, you, like you inspired me to like actually pursue it because not a lot of people want to pursue marine biology because quote unquote, there's no jobs and you don't make any money. Of course. And I'm like, no, no, no. Like, that's not true. And I've gotten so many DMs. And then some of them, I'm like, I really don't want to sit here and type all this out. But then other ones, I'm like, you took the effort to message me. I'll message you back. And I go through like all of them at one point and like message them for like hours and hours straight. But it's very humbling to know that people actually enjoy my stuff and it's not just like out there to no one for, to watch. Well, of course. Well, because the numbers can be, the numbers can be easily deceiving. And it's this thing when you talk about like people in government, they look like we're just numbers to them. It's like, because you're like, it's hard to conceptualize people in general but speaking of going through dms and answering them what are because i've i've only had a couple so far but there are certain ones that i'll answer and certain ones that i won't is there like a magic formula that you'll go through and you're like oh like you i can i can see that you're decent and so like i can respond or something like that um well i don't get enough dms on my instagram to like most of them are always super nice so i always oh, that's good I always answer them, but it's more my 
comment section on YouTube, I have mm. gotten into like full on arguments with people because especially on my video about Seaspiracy that I uploaded a couple weeks ago. Gotcha. Because with films such as Blackfish and Seaspiracy, people watch them. And then if someone disagrees with the film, they're like, no, you have to watch this video because you're wrong. So this guy was like, oh, well, everyone should be vegan and blah, 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 blah. And I told him, I was like, well, not every, that's not possible for everyone. And I'm not sure if Kendra has have touched on this with you, but on Twitter, there was mm -hmm. a fake NGO that was going around saying that indigenous seal hunting and whaling is barbaric and we should totally stop it. Yeah. And there were so many people coming after me in my Twitter DMs saying like, well, it's still an animal and blah, 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 blah. And living up in Alaska for the last couple of months has given me like a new view on it because at first I thought I was like well why can't why do they still do it like that's pretty outdated yeah but learning about it my mindset just like totally changed and I think people just don't know about it and they refuse to like learn about it so those dms I'll be like I'm not even gonna respond to you you don't deserve Fair. you don't deserve the time of day well, you, you don't deserve the time of day because you're not going to give it to me or the people that are doing it. You're going to have your opinion and you're going to keep it. If you want to have a conversation, I'll have a conversation. And that's another thing too. When I, the, the message or the, um, the TikTok that you got sent earlier, the one's like, where are you going to put them? I don't touch those comments. I wouldn't because, either. I don't no, like, like yeah. My, my goal with that video is like, I want people to, I, if, if three people see that and have seen uh, and like have gone out and said we should free all the killer whales I want them to be free and then they stop for a second and think like okay where do they go like that's that's what I wanted with that video and so anybody that's going on and arguing I'm like the TikTok comments is not the place to duke it out <laughs> yeah, you like, can do it separately on your own time you, you do it separately on your own time if you want to call me you can find my stuff like my e I have an email that's readily available and I'm willing to I'm willing to have a conversation um but it's, it's the one thing. It's like some people just don't want to do that. They, they're like, it's just a instinct reaction. It's like, oh no, we're, this, is, this is what I want to do. It'll be fine. And that's the problem with, I'm going to use Blackfish because I'm super informed about captivity. I grew up going to SeaWorld. I could still tell you which orca was which and where <laughs> they were born and everything like that. Of course. So with Blackfish, people are watching it and blackfish was meant to tug on your heartstrings there was very true things in that film but it was it just scratched the surface there's so much beneath it and these people would watch this film and they're like all right this is all i, I know everything about killer whale captivity and they wouldn't listen to SeaWorld's point of view they wouldn't listen to anybody else's point of view because like you said they're going to say release the whales, but they're not going to be like, where the hell are we going to put them? Because they're all, they, they simply cannot survive just by themselves out in the of ocean course. at this point. Yeah. It's well, it's, it's people that want to care just enough to have their voice heard. And which is usually the loudest too. It's like, I think they should be free. It's like, well, think about it for five seconds, <laughs> like five seconds. And this is, this is another thing too, is like when people ever say like, oh, I know things. I'm like, okay, like explain them to me. <laughs> and that's yeah. the thing too. It's like, oh, there's sea pens. I'm like, where? And pe people will have these ideas that these, a lot of these places exist when they're, they're still in the process of being built and you can support them. Surprisingly, if anybody has not go check out the whale sanctuary project, Laura Mutarino is doing great work. Um, mm -hmm. and that whole team. So it's just, it's just a wild ride. And when people say, oh, just free them, just put them, put, put them back in the ocean. Of course. I look at them and I'm like, okay, um, how about you go live in the mountains with no help, no resources, no nothing and see how long you survive. Yeah. Well, and, and also too, like more than that, the, there's, the, there was somebody that was telling me earlier, it's like, they'll get reintroduced to their pod. I'm like, number one, that's happened once. Number two, here's the thing about all of the, a lot of the whales that have gone in from Southern resident or other wild communities. And this is a thing that I actually thought about for a second. I'm like, whether or not they could be reintroduced isn't the problem. There's also a fact that the mothers have babies and the, all of the hunting techniques need to be learned. All of the vocalizations need to be learned. And you can't have a mother and a child learning that at the same time, especially in a matrilineal or like social group. 
Like it, that, that itself has to be like insane. I, I, I would love for it to be a perfect world and Lolita could be released back into her pod and Katina could, and every one of these whales could meet their pod again, but it's just not, I don't think it would ever work because they have lived in fake or synthetic pods for so long. And you have to think like, let's see, like Makani, he is um, Argentine, Argentinian and Icelandic. So okay. I believe, yes. So <laughs> if he, like, which one are you gonna go with? Because if he goes with into Iceland, there's a whole other part that won't make sense. And if you go to Argentina, there's a whole other part that won't make sense because they have made so many hybrids that they have no choice but to just put them in one singular fake pod at this point. Well, and that's also the weirdest thing about this that I, a lot of people don't understand is that like all orcas aren't the same. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> like it, it's a sincere thing. So for anybody that doesn't know, and we, we can even do this as a little introduction, there's like taxonomy, right? So we're homo sapiens. Orsinus orca is the name of this, like the genus and the species of killer whales, orcas, whatever have you. But the funny part is, is that once you get into orcas, there's another taxonomy. <laughs> there's ecotypes. And then under that, there's pods. And then under that, there's matrilines. And matrilines are family groups, so it's a little bit shorter. Pods happen within different ecotypes. And there are different ecotypes in every ocean in the world. Literally. <laughs> well, just look Literally at, every ocean. Just look at the southern residents. Like, you have the southern residents, but are you talking about K-pod, L-pod, or J-pod? Yes, precisely, precisely. No, it's it's fantastic. And that's the thing that I think a lot of people haven't um, dove into, but I think would be really, in, I, it's, a, it's a relatively easy concept to grasp. And I think putting it in front of them properly, because in order to learn this, it's usually you have to like do a little bit of a dive, not too much, not too much. Just a little, you need to read like one book <laughs> fully or like something to that effect to really try to like get where the setup of it. But it's worthwhile and it changes it changes your thought process about a lot of this stuff. It does. Like I remember ordering one book after reading Blackfish, and now I have spent too much money that I care to admit on books. That's more than fair. What was the first book? <laughs> oh God, I think it was um it was Beneath the Surface by John Hargrove. And gotcha. I don't like John Hargrove as a person whatsoever. <laughs> However, his insight that he put into that book does not compare because I think Death of SeaWorld, um, I'm almost done with it. Nice. David Kirby has a great way of writing books because he is an author, but mm -hmm. he wasn't a SeaWorld trainer. He didn't have that one-on-one -on -one aspect of working a SeaWorld and that's where John Hargrove comes in. I listened to that on audiobook too and it was so much better than reading it because I don't know, just to hear someone's voice while and like hear the emotion that John Hargrove put into that book so much better so i highly recommend listening to it on audible or like i um amazon audiobooks than reading it yeah i've heard so i was talking with um kendra on the podcast before this and we uh, john hargrove's beneath the service came up it's that's a well run down i need to get it my most recent purchase was um alexandra morton's mm -hmm. i think it was hold up oh it's it's hidden somewhere it's hidden somewhere i think i have it next to my bed um it's like not too late. Not on my watch. Not on my watch. Um, but that's more than fair. I, I do have to end up getting it. I think uh, <laughs> she gave the advice, get it from thrift books. <laughs> yes, I'm, I would love to do more audiobooks just because I read a book and then it just gets like tucked away somewhere and then I'll find it a year later and I'm like, oh, I forgot I had you. But <laughs> I kind of just wasted so much paper because I read you and I'm not going to probably read you ever again. But um, now I'm like starting to do what you do. And I make like stacks of all my books and they're like my decorations now. Right. I, I also feel like it's nice too. Cause it's like when people ask like, Oh, like, what should I read? I can send them a picture of the stack and I'm like, take your pick. <laughs> it's like, I, I gotta write numbers next to it. Be like, this is the order that I think you should read them. In, if anything. I I'm not a big reader. I will say that I only Fair. read books that have to do with orcas or killer whales. That's it. Like I read it, I started reading a book about humpbacks and I'm like, I'm bored. And I gave it to my friend. Thank it's God. the way it goes. It's the way it goes. I love to, there were some people who messaged and like, what's your second favorite whale? And I'm like, there isn't one. <laughs> At the end of the day, as, as interested as I am as, and as uh, 
as passionate as I will be about wildlife in general, my true, true interest lies within one species, which is super weird, but like, there's a lot of us. <laughs> there, there is. It's not, it's a personality trait at this point. Oh, it is. I am it's an so orca is. lover. We're, we're all the orcaholics. Yeah. That's, that, that's one of my favorite words that I've been using. And anytime that I'll tell somebody that isn't in the world, they're like, that is phenomenal. That you, you hit it on the nose. I'm like, exactly. <laughs> there was a lot more like because I'll go through your TikTok comments and there's people like oh my god I found my people and I'm like I didn't even know there were this many people no no and that's like I can so back in 2014 I went to Friday Harbor for the first time everybody's going to be hearing the stories about this trip forever but there was I was on a whale watch boat and there was this one girl on it who had the free willy pendant mm-hmm. now I was, I was born in 99, right? So like I was born after the VHSs came out with the pendant in them. So I didn't know that like the pendant existed outside of the film. Like it was something that was sold. So I'm sitting down on this whale watch boat, like little dumb 15 year old self looking at that being like, what? <laughs> like you're telling me I've been watching these for like 15 years now. And there's somebody else that's not only as interested, they have the fucking necklace. And it was just, it was, it was a wild thought. And I didn't say a word that entire whale watch just because I was sitting down trying to conceptualize like, holy crap, people like this. <laughs> Cause it's a wild thought. Cause no, there's no like community. There's, it's the same with the whale watching community because I started whale watching November of 2019. Okay. And I went like once or twice. And then I started going on my boss's boats, but this was before I got hired I see and that's a really funny story how I got hired but we can talk about that after <laughs> um, and I started like getting to know like the people on the boat like all the other deckhands and all the other captains and then sure. one of the captains invited me to a Facebook page it's called Southern California Whale Watching and it has like 3,000 people or something like there and I'm like there's more of me like <laughs> I'm not the only one it's the finding all these stuff is insane. There's a lot, and there's probably even way more out there than we know of. Like I find well, Facebook groups every single day. Oh yeah. And the, one of the things that I'm, I'm really trying to wrap my head around and, and like more than anything else, try to understand is that, especially too, I guarantee you've had people that reach out to you, TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, whatever else that are on all sides of this, like not the, like I'll call it the knowledge spectrum of like knowing a little bit what's out there. Like mm-hmm. I'm sitting here and I'm like, I think I know sincerely 40 to 30% of like everything that's going, every, like everything that's going on and the amount of people that are out there. Like I have a conception of like, I know about, I sincerely about 30% of everybody that's interested in actively working mm-hmm. and like of, not that I know names, just like the sheer amount of people. Whereas I'll post a video about free Willy and someone would be like, Oh, actually, did you know that like the whale's name is Keiko? I'm like, yes. <laughs> and I can only imagine that they would be as interested in expanding it. Mm-hmm. Just the amount of work to get to whatever places is, it's not easy. It's not. And I've had people in my personal life that they'll come up to me and they're like, Oh, did you know this? And I'm like, oh yeah, I actually didn't. I'm like, but how did you know that? And they're like, oh, well, I like, I will look on Instagram or I'll read some stuff. And I think a lot of people are a lot more interested than we give them credit for. Yeah. Like they, like they don't know that we're out here and that they're, we will accept them into our <laughs> little nerdiness pod that we made. <laughs> more than fair. And you just made a great point there. And it's something that I haven't done that I think I should is like, where did you find that out? Like, like where, where did you learn it? How did it go from there? I, I didn't, I've never thought of that before. That's, that's a great way to go about it. It's a phenomenal way to go about it, actually. That's super interesting. You're going to have my mind rising for the rest of the day. Also, I want to bring it back for a second, because this is a, con- or a question that I always love to ask people who grew up around SeaWorld and the rest, and especially because you know the whales. Do you have a favorite whale? I do. His, <laughs> I, my favorite is Makani, and that's because that was the first whale, because let's see here. Thinking back, I joined the SeaWorld community. I was at the end of seventh grade. So I was 12. Okay. Yeah, 12. Gotcha. And I think Makani, he was born February 14th. So the day before my birthday. Aww. So he was one of my favorites because I could always sucker my mom into taking me 
either like on his birthday birthday, (laughs) and he was one of the first whales that I kind of like grew up with too yeah and I also loved his sister Kalia Mm -hmm. and then his mom Kasatka who sadly passed away I think in 2017 but yeah Yeah. McCartney and Kalia are tied for my favorites that's fantastic that's fantastic when you say when you say joining the SeaWorld community actually before I ask that when you February 3rd 14th is it like the same year do you know that or is or is it just like the birthday itself he he yeah he was born I think I don't know the year off the top of my head but he was born probably in like 2014 right. yeah 2014. okay yeah. oh okay cool oh that's even cooler his little baby is like it's my birthday ah, that's awesome and SeaWorld would do like their list they would give him like a little birthday cake and <laughs> It's adorable. I want to share it with you. No, that's super fair. All right. So back to the, the SeaWorld thing. When you enter, so when you entered the SeaWorld community in like seventh grade, what does entered the community mean? Because I haven't done that personally. Oh my gosh, we could go on for hours about this. So uh, we, there are we have people, a lot of podcasts left. <laughs> there is so the SeaWorld community is people who Kendra was also a part of it. I learned that she also had a photography account. So the SeaWorld community is full of people who like to like go and take pictures of the whales and yep. we just kind of like share our love for SeaWorld. We have our own little orca nerd pod aside Fair. from like <laughs> the pod that we are in now. Of but, course. Um, yeah, so it's basically a lot of the people are really young now because you have people like me who have been aware of this since I was 14 mm-hmm. and it blows my mind because I always thought that the whole like SeaWorld phase and the SeaWorld community would die out as like the years went on but yeah. there are like 12 year olds that are in it now and I'm like you were literally like six when I started liking SeaWorld like <laughs> it's just so crazy to see it all like circle back around and it's all like there's new people coming in and then now and probably like three or four more years after then there's going to be more people but yeah it's crazy the SeaWorld community is somewhat extremely toxic it is a very not <laughs> as happy place as people like to say it is Aww, <laughs> there's a lot of problems sad. well like, with, with any with any close-knit community around whales there's a lot of people who have uh, a lot of opinions <laughs> yeah true <laughs> to say the least no, that's more than fair though, because I'm my experiences with SeaWorld because I grew up, like I said, in Massachusetts. So like I I would go to SeaWorld San Diego growing up just because I had family around the area. So like that was my like home base, so to speak, mm-hmm. in terms of like the parks and uh, orcas. And I only like my biggest entrance into the community was actually this would be really cool. My biggest entrance into the community community was I did a SeaWorld camp in like 2010. Oh really? Yeah, at San Diego. Love SeaWorld Camp. Oh, they, it was black. I still have in my. I wonder if I can find this right now. For those of you who don't see, I have a little like lockbox underneath where I am, or underneath my desk, and I'm pretty sure I have like they put your name on a little sticker on the side of your bed. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure I have that. But there's one person that I still keep in touch with from there because I saw on one of your YouTube channel or one of your videos you went to camp as well at one point i went pretty recently i went summer of 2019 because texas texas offers a it's called marine zoological career camp and it's basically like SeaWorld camp but for people in college and who are in the process of pursuing a career with captive animals and i also met one of my best friends through camp so i will always be thankful for SeaWorld camp because I still keep in touch with some of the people from it as well. Fair, fair. That's super neat. And this is my, this is my little thing. <laughs> Aww, that is so funny that you kept like that tiny little thing all these years, all the way from Massachusetts. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I had it. I brought it home. I'm like, cause it, it was such, it was such a like cool thing at the time. Like that was before. Cause I, I got the whale. I, I, my whale was adopted for me in 2011 or 2012. Mm-hmm. So it was really the only place I had. And also too, my parents, I remember like I found SeaWorld camp and I looked it up and I asked my parents, I'm like, Hey, can I go to this X, Y, or Z? And what ended up happening was, is they said, okay, like we'll bring you out, but you need to pay for the camp. 
And so like, I like scrounged up the, however much it was for like one week. Yeah um as a kid and so i was like super proud i'm like this, this is like i did this and they paid for the flight and the rest but i was like it was it was a really cool thing to to create to say the least that i was i think how much was SeaWorld world camp now because i know the ones for the younger kids are a lot less expensive than the ones for the older kids because obviously you get to do multiple stuff. yeah it's different experiences i i think i remember i saved up all of my money like I worked at Starbucks at the time. I was not making, <laughs> I was not making a lot of money. And I remember saving like every ounce of every paycheck. And then I bought my camp and I was like, I did that. That was me. I just did I'm, that. I'm setting myself up. <laughs> and I was like, I did that. Good for you, Michaela. And then when I actually was at SeaWorld camp, I had a realization. I was like, I don't want to work at SeaWorld anymore. Like, this is kind of boring. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah well what was it well like where, where because you, if you say you were there and you're like maybe not so I was there and at that point I was already kind of like do I want to still support SeaWorld like do I not because I bought camp in December and okay. I didn't go until July so that was like seven time. months of me just like sitting and thinking and yeah. so before I went to camp I was like do I really even want to support SeaWorld anymore like I'm not sure and then I was like Michaela you just spent so much money on this <laughs> going there's no way in hell you are not going and so I went and I had fun it was a lot of fun but just I don't know just being behind the scenes not to say SeaWorld like hide stuff behind the scenes or anything but just seeing dolphins and whales out in the wild and then going and seeing that and like I don't think I want to support SeaWorld anymore or go to SeaWorld anymore but of course I landed home from Texas and then the next day I went to SeaWorld. So it obviously didn't stop me very much, but I think it wasn't until January, 2020, me and my friend did a trip to Orlando and we did the whole mm-hmm. like, world and we did the whole SeaWorld thing. And I sat in Killer Whale Stadium and I was like, I am never coming back here. I will never support SeaWorld ever again. And from that point on, I never went back and I don't plan. I wanted to go back to make kind of like a small documentary about sea world but yeah. that's still like the wheels are still turning about that so yeah i haven't been back since so that was a very like sudden thing i was like i'm not not coming back this is it that's it that's fair. that's fair no it's it's a it's a quick switch and also to the juxtaposition exactly like you said it's like for a lot of people that i've heard of like that are uh going to sea world consistently or really like it and then they go and they have the ability to go to a whale watch or see a lot of these animals uh, in the wild in whatever habitat. It, the juxtaposition is so striking that going back is it, you, you look at it differently. And that being said, I, I think the only place that I've gone to personally, like I went to Marineland three years ago, mm-hmm. maybe, maybe two, no, three. It has to be three. This pandemic's been going on for a year and a half. Holy crap. I know. <laughs> it's crazy. The whole, what year and a half? I'm literally yeah. in the same spot mentally as I was a year and a half ago. Not, no, a, just- not a question. Not a question. No, um, but it, I think that was the only time that I've gone to a place that held captive orcas since I went to San Juan Island for the first time. Mm-hmm. And that was just because I was in Niagara and I hadn't been there in a while. And I like... I wanted to see, I wanted to see Kiska. Like I was like, mm-hmm. I, I, I want to put my eyes on it. Um, so we went in literally, I spent eight hours sitting there talking to the naturalist on the side, just sh- literally shooting the shit for eight hours. There. So in March of 2020, literally the week before the whole world went to shit, yeah. I was in Miami, Florida doing shark research with, oh, this, with this um, company called Field School okay if you guys are interested in getting like field experience highly recommend checking them out they're awesome and we were literally like here's miami seaquarium and the harbor that we because we lived on a boat for a week was right like less than a mile there so i was like do i want to spend the i think it was like 50 bucks it's not expensive i was like do i want to spend the 50 bucks and go and see what it's all about but i i couldn't bring myself to it because i was like I talk so negatively about Miami Seaquarium and just to like go and put my money towards Miami Seaquarium just didn't sit with me. Fair. 
yeah but i was more than this, fair. this close to going but i decided not to it, i couldn't bring myself to i it, it's and this is the thing that i realized continuously it's always an inner moral decision whenever like once you get to this stage of i am i am speaking about these uh, issues and scenarios and things like that. And I, I do, I have my opinion out there. And so making them match with, especially to how you view yourself and like, okay, what am I going to put towards is always a hard one to battle with. I think Miami Sea Aquarium is a very special one. And the like way that I've conceptualized myself, actually we'll do this a little bit. The Miami Sea Aquarium, for those of you who don't know, yeah. um, here, do you want to explain Lolita? I'll, I'll give that, so I'll give that four to you. Actually. Okay. So Lolita is 100% Southern resident. She was captured in the famous pen code captures on August 8th. No. Yes. August 8th, 1970 from pen code, Washington. That capture is a lot of the reason why the Southern residents are endangered. They are endangered. Yes. Because of the Chinook salmon and the damming of the rivers. But if you look back at those captures, that has a lot to do with it as well. So Lolita was captured and brought to Miami's Aquarium where she currently still lives. She is the only Southern resident from the Penco captures that is still alive to this day. Every one of her companions that she was captured with has, uh, has since passed away. And she did live with another killer whale named Hugo. And I believe Hugo was also Southern resident and was also captured either right before or during the Penco captures. But Hugo died and I think over 30 years ago. And ever since then, she has not seen another killer whale. And for those of you who don't know, killer whales are highly social animals. They, I would put them almost as equivalent as humans, but she lives with a couple Pacific white-sided dolphins. And of course, dolphins and killer whales don't naturally hang out together and so Lolita is a, she, her tank does not reach the legal capacity that it should be. Mm -hmm. If you guys want to read more about Lolita, there's a book, it's down in California, but it's, it's called a Puget Sound Whale in Captivity. It's all about Lolita. And I learned that Miami Seaquarium actually wanted to capture Keiko and rescue him after he was released from, um, and I think, where was he released? In Iceland? Iceland, yeah. Iceland. They wanted to capture him in Iceland and take him to Miami Seaquarium. They talk about that in the book. But Lolita is known as the loneliest whale in the world. That's her, like, propaganda name. But mm -hmm. her real name is to Tokite, how you pronounce Tokite, it? Tokite, Tokite, yeah. So that is her original pod, her name from El Pod. But yeah, Lolita lives in Miami Seaquarium. It's a very, very sad situation. It's not the easiest to read because she has a very sad life, but that's just background on yeah. Lolita. Not a lot of people know who Lolita is and they don't know that Miami Seaquarium is there. And then when I point it out, they're like, how is that legally allowed? And I'm like, <laughs> it's, it's not actually. <laughs> it's not, but you tell me how they're still open because I sure as hell can't freaking figure it out. Yeah. Um... No, that, that's the thing too. Whenever people talk about like SeaWorld's the worst, I'm like, you haven't looked. Um, so that, that's another big one. Personally, I think I've, and this is, this is to bring it back. This is the reason that I want to explain who Lolita was in full versus first. The man who was in charge of capturing Lolita or like in, in charge of that capture was Ted Griffin. And Ted Griffin, long time, um, he was one of the guys who started the orca capturing business. And so if you haven't read Jason Colby's book, Orca, How We Came to Love, Know and Love the Greatest Predator, it explains the story of how Ted Griffin went from the very first whale that was in captivity for entertainment purposes, um, all the way to the Pen Cove captures and then even afterwards. And then there's also Ted Griffin's book, Namu Quest for a Killer Whale, which you hear him in first person. The deal that I've made with myself is that I'm allowed to go to Miami Sea Aquarium once and once only. And this is specifically because of two things. Number one, Ted Griffin has visited Lolita in my Aramis Ukraine once. And this is, it was, it was an, not an act of reconciliation, but it was, it was a full circle kind of thing. If you want to hear more about that, look up Jason Colby. He has a couple talks. Um, he was actually the one that went with him before that. Um, 
but just understanding the breadth of the situation and seeing Lolita as part of this insane story, especially too, because she is for me a huge representative of where we started to where we are in terms of research conservation, because when Lolita was captured, we didn't know the Southern residents were the Southern residents. And that capture was a big part in the way that we do know all of the whales now because it started off the census in both the United States and Canada. So seeing Lolita, because I'm not sure if she's going to make it out sincerely before the end, I, I think for me personally, it would be a, it would be a more symbolic viewing than anything else but that's why i say once we should, all, once we should all get like the orca lovers together and take like a field trip to miami sea aquarium one one day and we can all like visit lolita but um fun fact there was a killer whale captured i think her name was wanda she was either one of the first or if not the very first whale captured to put into marine land of the pacific mm -hmm. I believe uh, Victoria, if that's right. Sealand of the Pacific. No, no, then it wasn't Sealand of the Pacific because it was in Los Angeles, California. Oh, yes, 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 yes. All the way back. Yeah. All the way, like all the way back. Yeah, yeah. This is like this is like 59 or 61 or some crap. Yeah. She was captured in the same harbor that my well watching boat is stationed or like um out of goes out of. That's and insane. I did a it wasn't an internship. But um, if you don't know who Elisa Shulman Janiger is, amazing woman. I highly recommend checking her out. She is known as the killer role queen here in okay. California. Amazing. I'll send you her Instagram and everything later. But I did a thing with her. We would count gray whales as they pass by on shore. And it was a little like census we did. Well, yeah. that was like less than five miles away from where that original sea park was. And I believe Corky was originally there. And mm -hmm. then Wanda was also there. And it was, it was like surreal to think like, cause you could see from where we were, where it was set up. And I was like, that, I could not wrap my head around that fact that there were killer whales at that point right there. Yeah, you, well, and that's a thing too, when people, when people look at, the extent of orcas in captivity a thing that everybody forgets is what it was like before whales were in captivity and like the the proper experiences of that time in particular from like 55 1955 to 1973 like the coast was the wild west in terms of perception and the way people were going the first whale that was ever like captured in vancouver at the very least it was shot with a harpoon and then people on vancouver island or it wasn't vancouver island they were on another island within the canadian archipelago underneath here there were islanders that came down and shot at it like that was and like it wasn't a thought it everybody hated the whales at the time so like to see and sincerely think about the the history of the area and put it into proper perspective it's something that one a lot of people don't do and you should and you should read some of the books on here and we'll make a list definitely um of ones particularly this one's about moby doll that i'm talking about right now um it it changes the way you understand the story i for for the fact that i do not support killer role captivity anymore i will never not be thankful that it happened because we have learned so much about these animals we we learned that they have a whole part of their brain that we don't have and i don't think we would have learned that unless we had whales that we could observe in captivity because the only way you can really get inside of a wild killer whale is if it dies and it strands or if it dies and people are able to go out on a boat and get it. But that's one good thing about having killer whales in captivity. There's so much like hands-on things that we can do because in the United States, you can't just drive up to an orca and say, oh, let me get some genetic test samples from you and bring them back to a lab. And I'm sure it's the same way in Canada. I think it does the Marine Mammal Protection Act transfer into Canada or how do you guys do that? That's a great question. Like I said, I know about 30%. So there's still more to learn. Um, but I'm pretty sure too with here, it's like, 
no one would have developed the techniques to even get breath samples and try to try to do that. Like they, they are able to genetically know a lot of the Southern residents, but that's only because of research that's done because the census occurred. And then people started to give a shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Pretty, yeah. That's exactly it. People started to actually say, Oh wait, these aren't just like stupid whales. These are like actually like he, like animals that have purpose and have a lot of information to them. What? Yeah. Well, pe- people started to care about them. It's hard. It's hard to care about a whale when all the only people interacting with them are um, fishermen that think that they're taking their catch. Like yeah. whale watches weren't weren't huge, and then and then all of this goes through. I think uh, I don't know if you follow Colin Ray or have heard of Colin Ray on Instagram on TikTok. He's um he's like the friendly felon. <laughs> he uh he, he went to jail for like a, I think it was seven years or a good amount. And I, this is this is a this is a pro- proper side. It's like he when he looks back he's like he appreciates everything that it taught him doesn't mean what he did was right doesn't mean that anything was good but it's you can still sit down and say i like we are where we are today because of all of the events that ensued yeah we and, and it needs to, it deserves to be it, it it needs to be recognized in order to be fully conceptualized it does and i think what a lot of people don't realize is yes killer oil captivity is not ideal and no we can't go out and release them but could you imagine how much we would not know about killer whales and about our oceans if there wasn't animals in captivity and could you imagine how many people would actually give a shit to learn because i wanted to be a marine biologist from going to sea world and seeing these animals and learning about them and that's how a lot of people i know start out wanting to pursue marine biology is going to sea world or going to a different marine aquarium and seeing dolphins or turtles or anything so if we didn't have a single being in captivity we wouldn't know even a third of what we know now i i wouldn't i wouldn't be doing of anything that i am today and this is another part too it's like standing on the shoulders of giants is i think like I don't know where that phrase is from. It's something in the science community because it's so true. It's like all of the information that me and you have so readily available in terms of understanding how how you can identify a whale, how you can tell if it's doing well. There was somebody, Michael Big had to go in 1972 and like prove to the government that he could properly discern different whales from each other so that a population could be made. Like, yeah. The 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 amount of groundwork that's done as well that's happened for a great number of um research or otherwise in conservation more particularly it it's insane. And also like this is another thing you could do. It also helps the economy. The whale watching industries in both California and the Pacific Northwest, heavily in the Pacific Northwest, it's a multi-billion dollar industry that's bringing tourists from all over the world continuously. Oh, like yeah. Like the cities themselves are profiting off of it, whether they think it or not. And it's, and it's like, and it's helping all of the people that are like doing those jobs. And then more than that too, all of the communities around mm-hmm. it's, it's all, it's all way more connected and complicated than anybody truly understands. And <clears throat> excuse me, no there worries. was a lot of talk about, cause people in that um, support captivity like to come at, whale watchers and be like, well, you don't think you're stressing out whales? You don't think you're harming these animals when you're going in whale watching? And whale watching isn't perfect. There is, there are times where my, the whale watching in Newport is always very, we follow the rules because we want to continue doing this. A lot of the times that we will see, I have so many videos on my phone of private boaters like almost running over whales mm-hmm. and I don't think people understand that the whale watching companies are not the ones that are like presenting the biggest, problems. biggest problems presenting the biggest problems yeah because a lot of whale watching boats like if they play the same role as SeaWorld does when someone goes and want and learn something about a whale they're gonna go home and have a greater appreciation because you don't really appreciate something unless you know something about that one thing of course and when you were talking about 
the economy, there's like uh, probably tens, if not a dozen different whale watchings in Juno. Mm -hmm. Juno is coming up on their second season of no tourism and it is heavily impacting Juno. And I don't think people realize that because living in California, we always have tourists. Even last summer in the middle of the pandemic, there were people on our whale watching boats. Definitely. But people like up in the Pacific Northwest, I assume they have a chunk of tourist season in the summer that per- profits a lot towards them. And to just simply just stop, if we stopped every single thing that quote unquote stressed a whale out, there would be no Friday Harbor. There'd be no whale museum. There'd be no San Juan Islands. There'd be like nothing. It, it would be it would be an entirely different world, mm-hmm. honestly, sincerely. Uh, I'm glad you brought up Juno because you're you're exactly right with a lot of those places as well because they're places that people won't really think about when, um, when they're looking at this stuff, which is, it, which is its own sense of insane. And then here's another thing too, and that people talk about killer whales being a um, a staple species. It's like killer whales are like polar bears or seals in the sense that. If you have killer whales in your water, you can guilt people into doing better for the environment. It's like, do you really want to kill Oreo, dude? Like you try, you trying to get the pod from Free Willy to really like have a rough go right now. And, and you can, it's, it's a lot easier to do that than saying they're killing coral or kelp or otherwise. Um, so it, they, they can act as a mechanism for a betterment of just the, the natural environment itself and in and of itself. I think that it also is like that because there we know so much about the Southern residents and about certain um, species that they all have names and they all have different personalities. And people are like, oh, like when they think of coral, they're like, that's coral. Yeah. Or like, that's kelp. Like, I don't really care yeah. about that. But when people start saying, oh my gosh, that whale named Oreo or the whale um, granny who lived to be so long, like these have names and they're so cute. And I think it makes it a lot more personable to them because I know I don't like le- learning about coral or kelp, which may, make, might make me a horrible marine biology student, but it doesn't interest me. Yeah, well, it, but, it doesn't, it doesn't peak. It's not, it's not the same. <laughs> and I think so many people love orcas. It's because they out of every animal on this earth, they are probably most related, not related, but closely to humans because they all have their own personalities and they all have their own likes and dislikes and their own names and they all don't look the same. Yeah. Well, this, my, I think my favorite thing personally is like, and I'll ask you actually, first I'll ask you first, what is your favorite thing about orcas? Like when, when, when you, when you think about orcas, what is the one thing that you're like, oh, I really like, like this aspect of orcas, the community, like any, anything. Mm-hmm. I would say just how freaking beautiful these animals are and how magnificent these animals are and just how badass they are <laughs> Nothing in the ocean will even think about challenging an orca. We have oh, orcas that are killing sharks. Mm-hmm. That's badass. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's absurd, and that they're they're more powerful than like people will know. Like, oh my god, either kill cute killer whales, or people are like, those are the demons of the sea. And you're both correct. <laughs> you are both very much correct. A hundred percent. I think one of the things that I've been really happy with with like the orca world is like you can technically learn all of it. You. It, there's there's enough there's enough whales and enough organizations don't get me wrong there's a ton around the world but in comparison to like I, I don't know what I could compare it to like I can know the name of every whale in captivity in two weeks if I really wanted to I could know the history of all of them good dating back and who was related to who and who was captured from where and who captured them like it's readily accessible information that is like easy enough to attain and it's a story that as as broad as it is is very concise in all of its workings like you can follow a timeline for orcas and it all really makes sense and it's like digestible like i have what 12 or 15 books on my on my thing right now i think i'm missing 10 max 
for all of the major, major works that have been done on Orcas and not additions or anything like that. But in terms of the stories that have been told, like it's so incredibly doable to, to dive into this realm. And I find that like, it's, it's, I find that cooler every time that I like have another conversation or otherwise. It's easier to find out where Lolita was captured, when she was captured and who captured her and everything that leading up to her being in Miami Seaquarium than it is finding my math homework answers online. Yes, <laughs> it is. <laughs> it is. And it's far more interesting than math homework answers. <laughs> it is. Like I, there is a website called Orcapod Wiki and they have every single known captive killer whale past and present you can so say I wanted to learn about Tilikum. I mm-hmm. could look up on their website Tilikum, and they would show, oh, this is where he was captured, and this is where he died. This is what he died of. This is how he was captured, and it's just so mind blowing that we know that much about an animal who we still know so little about. We don't know even we know so little about killer whales because there are some species like offshores we know like nothing about offshore orcas of course that's what we were going back to before not all orcas are the same as there's anything you should take out about this podcast specifically this episode not all orcas are the same different ecotypes different the rest and if you look up orca ecotypes you'll actually come upon a graphic from uh noah and you'll you'll be able to learn very quickly some of the differences so that that's also readily accessible yeah oh i guess we should say like what the three main different types of orcas are. So you have residents who are going to be your fish eaters. They are very, very, very picky. They will, they refuse to eat anything but fish, which is why the Southern resident population is so endangered because they are like, no, we just want our fish. And if we can't get our fish, we're not going to eat anything else. Then you have the transients, which are your mammal eaters, which I think are the most interesting because you can go well watching like in monterey i think it was yesterday i yeah. both have a couple friends that are up in monterey they saw 30 orcas yesterday right 30. that's insane <laughs> 30. and so my friend was posting um there was this sea lion it's actually kind of a sad picture when you think about it but the sea lion is like trying to <laughs> climb climb the side i'll have to send you this picture but it's climbing the side of the boat to try and avoid being eaten by a killer whale and i'm like i would pay so much money to watch that unfold because transients are so interesting and they're kind of assholes in a lot of people's eyes because oh yeah you're killing baby whales and baby sea lions but so those are your mammal eaters so they're going to be eating whales um dolphins your porpoises and your sea lions etc and then you have the offshores, which we know little to nothing about because as their name states, they live offshore and not a lot of people are offshore doing research, but yeah. those are your shark eaters. So those guys are like top the dogs. most badass. Top, top, top dogs. Yes. Yeah. And it, this is another thing too, though. It's like if you, those are the three main and then you go into like different types as well, which is super interesting. You get like type C and type D who look, so different than any of the orcas that you could properly imagine now but they're the same species technically still so i don't even know that much about like type c or type d the only thing i know about type d really is they have like the tiniest little eye patch and they look a little bit ridiculous they look kind of funny they do look ridiculous i'm pretty sure they have a little bit bigger head up front too like it's (laughs) it's it's a it's a interesting formation like different um phenotypic variation yeah. yeah science terms there we go <laughs> no but that's it's masterful it's so interesting and i did see that picture actually it's just it's just so funny i'm pretty sure it was on um erica's page i ended up following her later how did you become friends with that whole crowd oh okay so and i was gonna answer this on your live last night but i was like i'll talk to him in the morning and i'll just <laughs> so i know it's dan right yeah yeah yeah, the E is silent. So I, t- I know Dan because he works on a Monterey Bay whale watching boat. And yeah. I went up in November and went whale watching November of 2020. Okay. Um, we just kind of started talking because I was here with this huge camera 
Uh, and unless you're like deep into the realm of like wildlife photography, marine biology, et cetera, you're not going to have like a super professional setup. Definitely. So he, we started talking and I was like, oh yeah, I work down in Newport and blah, blah, blah. He was like, I know exactly who you work for. Like I've been on your guys' boat before. And then I know Erica because I work with Erica. She is oh, another sick. photographer on our whale watching boat. Oh. And I'll have to send you a couple, like I have a coworker in Mark and Delaney, they are so amazing with photography. They went out with my boss back in November and they yeah. were like 60 miles off the coast and they came across like 12 random orcas. Oh, sick. And I'll have to send you them because they're all in like the whale watching orca community too. Cool, so. cool, cool, cool. Yeah, I just found Dan. I know you're listening to this right now as well. What's up, man? Um, but I, I found... Dan somehow, or I think he found me on Instagram um, through Erica from Breach, Breaching Extinction. Yes. So it's like a, a little whirlwind. It's so funny too, because now like the more people that I talk to, the more one connected I'm realizing it is because it's going to be a huge web, but two, like how many people are in different places? Cause I can remember sitting down and thinking like only people that are above like 50 are actually super into this stuff and otherwise. And I went on like a, a dive a couple of days ago into um, co-extinction film, PNW protectors and a couple of other websites um, just to look and be like, okay, what are people actually doing? Because I've heard of, I've heard of stuff. I've looked a little bit, but I haven't done my deep dive to the extent that I should yet. Um, mm-hmm. And so I just, I did a surface level and it was, it was super interesting to, to really see the communities itself. And especially to, um, oh, what's his name? I think it's Brian from Blackfin Coffee. Mm-hmm. yeah a couple other people that are just around but that, it's it's so it's so cool to see and i think colleen the one who was on your instagram live last mm-hmm. night if i remember correctly she is the marine biologist on the boat that dan works on oh sick so, so fun because i know that their marine biologist is named colleen but then when she said oh dan showed me yeah that then i was like okay they probably know each other and that's probably how <laughs> know each other that's super cool and if i'm correct there was didn't they show i think it was your erica um free willy for the first time yes i think so yeah what? which i that that blows me away <laughs> like you can't yeah. go that long you're over here like worshiping free willy and you're like Are you how kidding you me? <laughs> you're like how have you not seen it honestly I even I don't even have the fourth one up. I think it's hidden. <laughs> you might kick me off of your podcast right now, but I haven't seen anything past the second one. That's okay. There's only two after that. There's Free Willy Free, which is there. It's called The Rescue. It's pretty neat. The second one's better in my opinion, but it's worth a watch. It's cool that you are able to watch another Free Willy for the first time. That's a cool yeah. experience. The fact that you've seen the first one, that's all that really, really matters. Like the second yeah. and third, it's like you're deep into the free willy world so to speak but um but the 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 first is like that's always i'm surprised if somebody gets this far within this community and no yeah. one sat them down and been like are you fucking serious like come on like you you haven't seen the one the one movie i remember i was flying home from somewhere this was a couple of years ago yeah. and i think no i was flying home from my orlando trip where I decided I wasn't going to support SeaWorld anymore. And mm-hmm. they were having free movies on their flight. And I watched Free Willy twice on that flight. Nice. Because I finished it and I was like, I, I just want to watch it again. It's just such a good movie. Really solidify it. Really solidify it. Do you know? Okay, so this is like one of the coolest Orca history things that I know. Mm-hmm. Um, do you know the story of Miracle by chance? Mm-mm. Okay, so there's this whale named Miracle. And they, she was up the coast in Vancouver Island. So she was slowly but surely making her way. She went past Nanaimo to this other little bay. And there was a dude that went out and like fed her fish every day. She was heavily infected and things like that. This was in like 1972. So like way back. <laughs> um, story? Hmm? Is it a true story? It's a true story. Yeah. Um, Killer Whale, The Saga of Miracle by Paul Jayoon. I can send you a picture of that. Um, okay. I just finished the book. Super, super cool. But basically they call up a bunch of people and Bob Wright from Sea Land of the Pacific or one of the, um, one of the aquariums down in Victoria was like, okay, let's try to rehabilitate and save this whale. 
So they get a bunch of people and like set it up so that they can lift the whale, put it into a truck and then drive it down. Now they drive it down and they put it into a hotel pool. And this is actually the whale that I keep on talking about that was airlifted by helicopter, um, which I think is just the craziest thing in the world. Um, but the one of the like neatest parts of that story is, you know, the scene when they're like driving the whale to the co like the um, the area where it leaves, right? In when they're Willy. driving, yeah, in Free Willy, when they're driving Willy with like yeah, the yeah. trailer in the back. Mm -hmm. In 1972, there was a dude with a truck with a whale attached to its bed <laughs> driving down the island for seven hours. <laughs> to go to to go to this hotel pool so that they could help save this whale and i think the fact that somebody's actually driven with a whale attached to their truck bed i think was the funniest thing that i learned oh my gosh you reminded me of a story when you said truck so there was this guy who yeah. drove around a dead sperm whale Ooh. in this refrigerated i swear to god fred i will have to send you this he made like I, I wish I remembered what it was called, but I saw it like a couple days ago and I like quickly read it and then yeah. had to go to class. But he basically, he drove around in this huge like refrigerated tank mm -hmm. and, uh, on a truck, a dead sperm whale. And I think he had like a couple other animals. But yeah, when you said whale in a truck, I was like, I have to tell Fred. It's what? not normal. But the <laughs> oh, do you know where he was going? I think he literally wanted to do like a tour of America with this dead sperm whale in his That's truck. That's terrifying. I know. Yo, serial killers are dangerous and scary. I don't want to talk to that guy. <laughs> like, if there's anybody that I wouldn't want to stumble upon, I, it's the man with a sperm whale in his truck. Bed. Are you kidding me? Dude, I'll, I'll send you the link. It's, it's quite the read. Oh, I can imagine. I'll link it below in this thing as well, which mm -hmm. is insane. For those of you, I'm sorry for anybody listening to this on audio. If you are not come to the um, come to the thing, but that's the picture inside the book that they have. As just, I, I wanted to share because I saw the picture too, and I was like, "Wow, that's a uh, somebody actually he did that." It's oh, and if you don't listen or watch the YouTube, that sucks because. It, Fred got to have his hair wrapped up at the beginning and it was quite funny. Oh yes, I, I had my hair in a plop earlier. I just got out of the shower before I did this. I woke up late today. So yeah, and I, I took it out about halfway. So some of you have been enjoying the luscious locks, but you did miss the plop. You can go on and look for like five seconds if you really want a good laugh. <laughs> yeah, but there's your incentive. There's some cool things that happen when you watch video. <laughs> definitely definitely and i don't know uh, well i've already probably done this by now but be on the lookout i might be doing subscriber giveaways i know for my first 100 the first 100 people that subscribed which is going to be hopefully way before this episode six now um i'm giving away an orc adoption kit from the web museum i wanted to steal your idea when i hit 2000 so oh hell yeah so i think i'm gonna steal it and have some like the winner have a whale adopted in their name. I'm Mr. Right. Brady. I think it, I think it's super cool. It's super nice. And the person like I, I think it's sincerely um, would be uh, a good experience for them to have as well. And supporting there's 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 so much good that comes out of it that it's just worth it. I'm waiting for my package from the whale museum to come. You have another one with my orca adoption paperwork. And it says it was delivered, <laughs> but it wasn't. Cool. Like, it wasn't yeah. delivered. It was not delivered yet. How dare they? How dare they? If you want to see the um, what's called your most recent haul, I know that you put it up on TikTok, Instagram, yeah, yeah something like that. Yeah, TikTok. Hell yeah. Um, Hell yeah. I think it was because I ordered a sticker and then I was like, wait, no, I want to adopt an orca. So I have two separate ones coming in. Mm. And so another whale mail haul coming to the TikTok near you. Love that whale mail. The amount of puns and uh, rhymes that have been coming out in the past couple of days, it's been insane. I know for the first podcast and the rest of my stuff, I have welcome to the podcast, like W-H-A-L-E. And I'm like, wow, we're, we're starting to get deep, <laughs> deep into the, deep into the dad jokes of, uh, of will community. Yeah. Like I said, it's not a hobby. It's a personality trait. <laughs> definitely definitely all right we're inching up on like an hour or something so i feel like this is a really good point to kind of wrap it up and especially too i see a lot more conversations i would say i'm doing this podcast for a great while um so i'm excited to have you on going forward as well 
I am always happy to. I'll be maybe at home in California, but I will still be happy to. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. You want to plug uh, your socials? Just yeah. give it to anybody who'd be around. Yeah. So a lot of my stuff is just Michaela Manschult. Um, so then that's my Instagram. If you want to follow my personal life, I think I'm a pretty interesting person. Um, <laughs> then I have my wildlife photography account, which if you find my personal, it's linked in the my bio, but that's Cetacean Nation, but with one N. And then TikTok is Michaela Manschult. YouTube is Michaela Manschult. So yeah, I don't think I'm on anything else. Instagram, Twitter. I'm on Twitter, but it's M underscore Manschult. I've slowly converted that into my marine biology, tick, not TikTok, Twitter, instead nice. of like my personal Twitter. So there's some stuff on there too, if you want to go check that out as well. Super nice. And for those of you watching on YouTube, this will be all linked in the bio as well. So you can just go down, click it and go straight from there. So that's going to be super good. And as you know, I'm the Orca Man. So you, if you haven't found me, well, you have now. Um, so thank you so much, guys, for listening. Thank you again, Michaela, for having us uh, sitting down, talking with me for this hour and a half. This has been one of my favorite conversations so far. So that's been a blast. Yay. And I hope the rest of y'all have a wonderful day. Wonderful. Bottom.